we come to a century of poetry. Anthony Thwaite continues his exploration of the 19th century by looking at some of the poetry of the 1840s. On the continent of Europe, the decade of 1840 to 1849, and in particular the year 1848, was a time of smouldering discontent and revolutionary spirit, breaking out now and then into actual conflict and demonstrable change. But to look at some of the characteristic English poetry of these years is to find little sign of such things. The second volume of Martin Tupper's proverbial philosophy, full of commonplace thoughts in commonplace rhythms, sold thousands of copies and no doubt helped to swell many a tedious sermon. Poe's The Raven, composed according to Poe as a strict exercise in how to write a successful poem, was indeed successful though it's almost impossible to read it today without putting on a funny voice. Neither Tupper in England nor Poe in America seemed to take any notice of what was going on elsewhere. The Song of the Shirt, which Thomas Hood published in the Christmas 1843 issue of Punch, drew attention to the miseries of the poor closer to home. But it was the young Matthew Arnold, in his mid-twenties, who looked gravely across the channel and then at the present prospect and who wrote a sonnet to a Republican friend, 1848. God knows it, I am with you. If to prize those virtues, prized and practised by too few, but prized, but loved, but eminent in you, man's fundamental life, if to despise the barren, optimistic sophistries of comfortable moles, who what they do teaches the limit of the just and true, and for such doing they require not eyes. If sadness at the long, heart-wasting show wherein earth's great ones are disquieted, if thoughts not idle, while before me flow the armies of the homeless and unfed, if these are yours, if this is what you are, then am I yours, and what you feel I share. That's from Arnold's first book, The Strayed Reveller, published in 1849. Through all those hedging subordinate clauses, you sense not only the seriousness of the man, but something of the poet he was about to become. That must wait for the next programme, though. Meanwhile, not in the same literary class, but right at the centre of events, the Song of the Lower Classes. Its author, Ernest Jones, was one of the leaders of the Chartist movement in the 1840s. The song was set to music, and can also be sung, apparently, to the air of The Monks of Old, not a tune I'm familiar with. We plough and sow, we're so very, very low, that we delve in the dirty clay, till we bless the plain with the golden grain, and the veil with the fragrant hay. Our place we know, we're so very low, tis down at the landlord's feet. We're not too low the bread to grow, but too low the bread to eat. Down, down we go, we're so very low, to the hell of the deep sunk mines. But we gather the proudest gems that glow when the crown of a despot shines. And whenever he lacks, upon our backs fresh loads he deigns to lay. We're far too low to vote the tax, but not too low to pay. We're low, we're low, mere rabble we know, but at our plastic power, the mould at the lordling's feet will grow into palace and church and tower. Then prostrate fall in the rich man's hall, and cringe at the rich man's door. We are not too low to build the wall, but too low to tread the floor. We are low, we are low, we are very, very low. Yet from our fingers glide the silken flow, and the robes that glow round the limbs of the sons of pride. And what we get and what we give, we know, and we know our share. We're not too low the cloth to weave, but too low the cloth to wear. We are low, we are low, we are very, very low. And yet... When the trumpets ring, the thrust of a poor man's arm will go through the heart of the proudest king. We're low, we're low, our place we know, we're only the rank and file. We're not too low to kill the foe, but too low to touch the spoil. 
The other four poems in this program are, if not actually escapist, quite beyond the actual social concerns of the decade. Thomas Macaulay, when he came to publish his Lays of Ancient Rome in 1842, can be seen to be exercising a deliberate historical imagination, not only in his themes, but also in his manner, which looks back, as he acknowledged, to the old ballads, to Percy's relics, and to Sir Walter Scott. The following ballad, Macaulay wrote, is supposed to have been made about 120 years after the war which it celebrates, and just before the taking of Rome by the Gauls. Horatius and his two companions are defending the bridge across the Tiber against the Tuscans. We pick up the poem at a crisis point about two-thirds of the way through, after much blood and wrenching of steel, and the other Romans struggling to hew down the bridge according to plan. But all Etruria's noblest felt their hearts sink to see on the earth the bloody corpses in the path the dauntless three. And from the ghastly entrance where those bold Romans stood, all shrank, like boys who, unaware, ranging the woods to start a hare, come to the mouth of the dark lair where, growling low, a fierce old bear lies amid bones and blood was none who would be foremost to lead such dire attack. But those behind cried forward, and those before cried back, and backward now and forward wavers the deep array, and on the tossing sea of steel to and fro the standards reel, and the victorious trumpet peal dies fitfully away. Yet one man for one moment stood out before the crowd, well known was he to all the three, and they gave him greeting loud. Now welcome, welcome, Sextus. Now welcome to thy home. Why dost thou stay and turn away? Here lies the road to Rome. Thrice looked he at the city. Thrice looked he at the dead. And thrice came on in fury, and thrice turned back in dread. And white with fear and hatred, scowled at the narrow way, where, wallowing in a pool of blood, the bravest Tuscans lay. But meanwhile, axe and lever have manfully been plied, and now the bridge hangs tottering above the boiling tide. Come back! Come back, Horatius! loud cried the fathers all. Back, Lartius! Back, Herminius! Back, ere the ruin fall! Back darted spurious Lartius, Herminius darted back, and as they passed, beneath their feet, they felt the timbers crack. But when they turned their faces, and on the farther shore saw brave Horatius stand alone, they would have crossed once more. But with a crash like thunder fell every loosened beam, and like a dam the mighty wreck lay right athwart the stream, and a long shout of triumph rose from the walls of Rome, as to the highest turret tops was splashed the yellow foam. And like a horse unbroken, when first he feels the rain, the furious river struggled hard and tossed his tawny mane and burst the curb and bounded, rejoicing to be free and whirling down in fierce career, battlement and plank and pier rushed headlong to the sea. Alone stood brave Horatius, but constant still in mind, thrice thirty thousand foes before and the broad flood behind. Down with him, cried false Sextus with a smile on his pale face. Now yield thee, cried Lars Porsena, now yield thee to our grace. Round turned he, as not deigning those craven ranks to see. Nought spake he to Lars Porsena, to Sextus nought spake he. But he saw on Palatinus the white porch of his home. And he spake to the noble river that rolls by the towers of Rome. O Tiber, Father Tiber, to whom the Romans pray, a Roman's life, a Roman's arms, take thou in charge this day. So he spake, and speaking sheathed the good sword by his side, and with his harness on his back plunged headlong in the tide. No sound of joy or sorrow was heard from either bank, but friends and foes in dumb surprise, with parted lips and straining eyes, 
stood gazing where he sank. And when above the surges they saw his crest appear, all Rome sent forth a rapturous cry, and even the ranks of Tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer. But fiercely ran the current, swollen high by months of rain, and fast his blood was flowing, and he was sore in pain, and heavy with his armor, and spent with changing blows, and oft they thought him sinking, but still again he rose. Never, I ween, did swimmer in such an evil case struggle through such a raging flood safe to the landing place. But his limbs were borne up bravely by the brave heart within, and our good father Tiber bore bravely up his chin. Curse on him, quoth false Sextus. Will not the villain drown? But for this stay ere close of day we should have sacked the town. Heaven help him, quoth Lars Porsena, and bring him safe to shore, for such a gallant feat of arms was never seen before. And now he feels the bottom. Now on dry earth he stands. Now round him throng the fathers to press his gory hands. And now with shouts and clapping and noise of weeping loud, he enters through the river gate, borne by the joyous crowd. They gave him of the corn land that was of public right, as much as two strong oxen could plough from morn till night. And they made a molten image and set it up on high, and there it stands unto this day to witness if I lie. It stands in the Comitium, plain for all folk to see, Horatius in his harness, halting upon one knee. And underneath is written in letters all of gold how valiantly he kept the bridge in the brave days of old. That brisk foray back into the ancient world is just one example, and in one manner, of a whole mid-century searching of the past, something which we'll find Elizabeth Barrett Browning inveighing against in Aurora Lee in the next programme. But there were other ways of using the past, ways of finding understanding and of solace. This is the case with Tennyson and his poem Ulysses, which he published in his two-volume 1842 edition, the book with which Tennyson really broke through to a large public. Years later, Tennyson made two comments on Ulysses. First, the poem was written soon after Arthur Hallam's death, and it gave my feeling about the need of going forward and braving the struggle of life, perhaps more simply than anything in, in memoriam. Second, directly comparing in memoriam, there is more about myself in Ulysses, which was written under the sense of loss, and that all had gone by, but that still life must be fought out to the end. It was more written with the feeling of his loss upon me than many poems in, in memoriam. Here, then, is Tennyson's Ulysses. It little profit that an idle king, by this still hearth, among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone. On shore, and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea, I am become a name. For always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known. Cities of men, and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honoured of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch wherethrough gleams that untravelled world whose margin fades for ever and for ever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, 
to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life. Life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things. And vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, and this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, my own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfil this labour by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centred in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail. There gloom the dark, broad seas. My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads, you and I are old. Old age hath yet his honour and his toil, Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends. It is not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows. For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. That, as I say, was published in 1842. That same year, Robert Browning published his dramatic lyrics. The book included one of his best and most characteristic pieces in a mode which he was to follow off and on for the rest of his life, the dramatic monologue, a strangely self-contained incident as if from some lost play, a moment of reflection or self-revelation from which we, the audience, have to grasp what surrounds it. One of the subtlest of this kind is My Last Duchess, an Italian Renaissance princeling showing a portrait of his late wife to some representative of his prospective wife's family. That's my last Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will please you sit and look at her. I said, Fra Pandolf, by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance, but to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Sir, it was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the Duchess' cheek. 
And perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say, Her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whate'er she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, it was all one. My favour at her breast. The dropping of the daylight in the west, the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. The white mule she rode with round the terrace, all of each would draw from her alike the approving speech, or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a nine hundred years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one, and say, just this or that in you disgusts me, here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth, and made excuse, e'en then would be some stooping. And I choose... Never to stoop. Ah, oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whene'er I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below, then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed, though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought of rarity, which Klaus of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. In 1846 appeared a volume called Poems by Curra, Ellis and Acton Bell, the first appearance on the public scene of the three Bronte sisters. It's long been well known that most of the poems in it had originally been written almost as byproducts of the fantasy or dream world of the sisters' imaginary kingdoms of Gondal and Angria. Yet to call them romantic exercises is too chilly and inaccurate. What sounds like a personal lament in Emily's poem, Remembrance, is a work of fiction. But then, so, of course, is Wuthering Heights. Fiction doesn't preclude passion, which can be quite as strong as any fact. Cold in the earth, and the deep snow piled above thee, far, far removed, cold in the dreary grave. Have I forgot my only love to love thee, severed at last by time's all-severing wave. Now, when alone, do my thoughts no longer hover over the mountains on that northern shore, resting their wings where heath and fern leaves cover thy noble heart forever, evermore? Cold in the earth, and fifteen wild Decembers from those brown hills have melted into spring. Faithful indeed is the spirit that remembers after such years of change and suffering. Sweet love of youth, forgive if I forget thee while the world's tide is bearing me along. Other desires and other hopes beset me, hopes which obscure but cannot do thee wrong. No later light has lightened up my heaven, no second morn has ever shone for me. All my life's bliss from thy dear life was given. All my life's bliss is in the grave with thee. But when the days of golden dreams had perished, and even despair was powerless to destroy, then did I learn how existence could be cherished 
strengthened and fed without the aid of joy. Then did I check the tears of useless passion, weaned my young soul from yearning after thine, sternly denied its burning wish to hasten down to that tomb already more than mine. And even yet, I dare not let it languish, dare not indulge in memory's rapturous pain. Once drinking deep of that divinest anguish, how could I seek the empty world again?